Amen. All right, so look at your Bibles there. Focus down on verse number 11. That's going to be um, the, the verse in 1 Corinthians 13 that we're going to be looking at this, even, or this morning. I'm sorry. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So this morning, what I want to talk to you about is I want to preach a sermon on TV or screen time in general. And you say, you know, well, man, you've already preached a sermon on that last year. I think, actually, that this is going to be one of those things. Now, we've been here for a month or a year and three months or so. I think that this is going to be one of those sermons that you're going to hear just about every year, if not more. And you say, why? And you know, what I'll do for you is I'll put it in different context and we'll look at different problems um, with um, TV, screen time, basically. Um, but you say, why, why is this a once a year? Why is this going to be a regular thing? Well, let me just uh, read for you a quote from Nielsen Company, the audience report. This is somebody that, uh, a company that reports statistics on how much TV or screen time people in the United States spend, um, how much time they spend in front of a screen. It says, the Nielsen Company audience report reveals that adults in the United States devoted about 10 hours and 39 minutes each day to consuming media during the first quarter of this year. The report, which was released Monday, included how much time we spend using our daily tablets, smartphones, personal computers, multimedia devices, video games, radios, DVDs, DVRs, and TVs. So basically this is talking about screen time in general. 10 hours and 40 minutes. That is well over half of your waking time of your life. So, you know, you say, didn't we do this a year ago? Well, we're going to do this, um, we're going to talk about this more, not less, in this church. And I'm going to talk about this screen time in the context this morning of all-time highs. That's kind of the, if I was going to have a title to the sermon, the title to my sermon would be All-Time Highs. Okay, now you all know that, you know, I like trends. Whenever you have a trend or, uh, you know, a graph of something over time, whenever you have an all-time high, if you look at the whole, you know, time frame of that graph, whenever you have an all-time high, you either have something that's very good or very bad. Okay, an example is, you know, if we have a trend and you have a trend of a factory or a power station and the trend is an efficiency trend and it's at an all-time high, I mean, that's something to be happy about. That's something to be, you know, good. But if you have something that's bad, like, you know, bearing temperatures, you know, you don't want to have a trend that where your bearing temperatures are the highest they've ever been. Or the temperature on your car is just running higher than it's ever run before. If you would look at a graph of that, that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. So all-time highs, basically, all look, here's how I look at it. All-time highs on trends, we're either high-fiving or we have an immediate problem that we need to find quickly. It's, it's one of those two things, right? So look, we're going to look at some all-time highs this morning. And we're not going to look at good all-time highs this morning. We're going to look at the, the type of all-time highs where it's, it's time to panic in your, in your life, okay? Now look, I'm going to just give you a few areas where screen time has caused some all-time highs in our country, in our society. Turn to Proverbs chapter 24. Turn to Proverbs chapter 24. The first point I want to make for you this morning, and I'll show you the all-time highs that come from this is that screen time, consuming, putting your face in front of a screen constantly promotes mental and physical laziness. It promotes mental and physical laziness. Turn to Proverbs chapter 24 and look at verse number 30. Look at Proverbs 24 and verse number 30. The Bible says, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. It's interesting that right away Proverbs ties these two things together in verse number 30. It says, it says, I went by the field of the slothful. That means the lazy man. Okay, it says, I went by the field of the lazy man, and the lazy man, it, it, said, it also ties that to void of understanding. So look, if you're lazy, you're also void of understanding. You have no understanding. Let me just break it down for you. You're stupid. You're foolish if you're lazy. Verse 31, and lo, it was over, all overgrown with, it was grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. 
Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and as thy want as an armed man. So look, let me ask you something. When you're sitting in front of a computer screen, or when you're sitting in front of a, te a television set, or whatever you're doing, you know, what are you doing? You're just sitting there, aren't you? You're just sitting there. You're not actually moving. You're sitting, I mean, many times, you're actually, especially in our culture, you're actually also eating. Right? Aren't you just sitting there, and then many times you're just eating? But look, you're not accomplishing anything. You're not accomplishing anything. Notice how this guy's property in Proverbs chapter 24 is a mess. It's overgrown with everything. You ever walk by somebody's yard that's completely unkept, falling apart, and the guy lives there? I mean, that's a lazy man right there. That's a lazy man. I mean, we spent, I mean, just my family, we spent, I mean, we don't have a big property. We don't have, we spent hours all day, all five of us, cleaning up and mowing and, and trimming and just taking care of the vineyard is what we did. So we wouldn't be this guy. Every few weeks, you just have to do that. Even if you have a small property, you have to take care of it. So look, here's another thing. If you look at uh, verse 34, not only is this man slothful, lazy, not only is he void of understanding, he's foolish, he has no wisdom, but look, poverty comes along with this. The Bible says that the slothful man, the man that doesn't take care, I mean, poverty comes along with it. It doesn't say that his place is a mess and everything's you know, wrecked because he's poor. It says that he's, this causes poverty, is what it says. It comes along with it. So look, let me give you an all-time high. Let me give you an all-time high this morning. That's the whole point of this morning's sermon. Childhood problems, attention problems, behavioral problems, you know, ADHD, uh, you know, I can't even name them all, you know, Asperger's and all these different um, diseases that children have, these behavioral issues that children have, they're at an all-time high today. They're at an all-time high. Now, here's what's interesting. You know, so we don't know what causes it, right? We just know it's at an all-time high. If you look at the graph of all these ch childhood behavioral problems, it looks like this. It's just climbing and climbing and climbing. So let me just read for you something from psychology today. This is the secular world talking to us here, okay? The Bible, or not the Bible, the secular world will say this. In discussion on children's behavioral disorders, there was an idea that was put forth on how to fix or a test on how to solve some of these behavioral disorders, these attention disorders, these behavioral disorders. And it was this idea of an electronics fast. An electronics fast. Basically, to just take these kids that are having these problems and take them away from their electronics, their phones, their screens, their computers, everything. Okay? Now look, here's what happened. If done correctly, this is from Psychology Today, if done correctly, this intervention, this fast, this electronics fast, can produce deeper sleep, a brighter, ev more even mood, better focus and organization, and an increase in physical activity. The ability to tolerate stress improves, so meltdowns diminish in both frequency and severity. The child begins to enjoy the things that they used to, is more drawn to nature, and imaginary and creative play returns. Have you ever noticed when you're out soul winning that basically, you know, there's no kids outside anymore? You ever notice like when we're in these neighborhoods and it's, you know, it's a 75 to 80 degree day? Have you ever noticed that, I mean, where are all the kids? I mean, why aren't there kids riding around on their bikes? We just mentioned that, my wife just mentioned to me that yesterday. We saw two kids on their bike riding through this neighborhood, and my wife said, that's weird, that there's kids outside. It's like 80 degrees, it's the perfect weather. Sunny, everybody should be outside. You used to be able to not drive through neighborhoods because there's games going on in the streets and all these types of things. Where are all the kids today? They're inside. They're in front of screens. But listen to this. The child begins to, you know, creative play returns. In teens and young adults, we're going to talk about this one later, an increase in self-directed behavior is also observed. This is the exact opposite of apathy and hopelessness. That's all from, that's, this is secular reasoning. Secular, look, when the secular world starts to notice it, I mean, it's a big problem. 
right? I mean, the Bible tells us about these things we already know, right? But when the secular world starts waking up going, hey, there's a connection here. We know that it's a glaring problem, all right? So they go far, they go far to say, they go as far as to say that taking a break from screen time fixes all these issues. But here's the strangest thing. Here's the strangest thing. They'll, they'll say that this electronics fast fixes all these problems, but they will never contribute the problem to the screen time itself, which is really weird to me, which is really strange. They're like, hey, you know, I mean, maybe that they would think that if getting kids away from these things solves these problems, that that screen time has something to do with the problem in the first place. But they don't make that connection. So look, if people that watch a lot of TV are lazy, I mean, that's the bottom line. So we can then infer that TV contributes to laziness. All right, now think of that next time, by the way, parents. I mean, this is going to be a lot for you parents. I want you to start, I want you to think of all these things I'm about to tell you that even the secular world has, has noticed. The next time you just hand your kids a screen or hand your kids some kind of video to keep them busy or to keep them, you know, from, you know, whatever. You know, just to keep them busy for a few minutes. All right, here's another thing. It's physical laziness, but it also contributes to mental laziness. Did you know that your brain needs exercise just like any part of your body? Did you know that? Think about this. I mean, why can't, I mean, think about this. Why can't TV, why can't watching TV be as educational as reading a book? I mean, isn't there, isn't there good books and poorly written books? I mean, there's good books and bad books, right? I mean, just like there's, good TV shows and bad TV shows as far as you know the way they're produced but look the bottom line is this TV is passive TV is passive it's fast paced on purpose because it is meant to entertain and keep your mind busy with visual effects think about this it's passive meaning you just sit there and it's all done for you these visual effects are what keep you entertained and keep you uh, you know attached to whatever it is that you're watching. Whereas reading a book, when you, hear, when you sit here and you read the details of a character, you read the details of a scene in a book, your mind has to work. Your mind, you, you have to fire that create, creative center of your brain to paint these pictures, to kind of think about what this character is like. That's why good writers can just totally just make you just set in a scene because they, it's so vivid the way they lay everything out, but your mind connects all those dots. So it's actual work for your mind. So look, that's why, by the way, that's why every movie that, or every book you've ever seen turned into a movie is so terrible. If you've ever read the book and then seen the movie, you're just, you're just wildly disappointed every single time. Because in the book, you have to think. You have to use your imagination. You have to create the characters. You have to see the scenes in your mind. You, it, it's, it's exercise for your brain. Or TV, everything's done for you. Uh, a, a way that I kind of, an analogy that I kind of see here, it's like fruit versus candy. Did you know if you eat a lot of candy, you'll never want to eat fruit? But fruit is God's candy. Fruit is God's way of, of us, you know, enjoying sugar in our life, right? But fruit also comes with a lot of good things. It comes with vitamins and fiber and all these different things that are very good for us, right? Whereas candy is just nothing but bad, right? It's just nothing but bad for you. That's why, I mean, in short, basically, TV makes you stupid. It makes your brain lazy and unable to work. Proverbs 24, 30, the man void of understanding. So, I mean, it makes you dumb, basically. And look, you say, I, I don't know, is there a connection? Well, never in history has there been a time where people in the United States know less than they know today. I mean, we've literally never been dumber than we are today. Here's a quote from Thomas Jefferson. He says in 1817, he said, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never will be. Interesting. We've never been dumber than we are today. Here's another all-time high. And that's great irony because there's never, so we've never been dumber than we are today, but there's also never been a time where more information was available to the common man than there is today. I mean, that's a great separation right there. I mean, think of this. We have an upcoming election. 
We have an upcoming election. That's all any, anyone ever hears about or talks about. And a, a recent poll showed that only 36% of Americans could name all three branches of government. That's like one in three. More than 40% of college graduates, college graduates, these are the best among us, the brightest among us. More than 40% of college graduates did not know what the Constitution, that the, that the Constitution grants the power to Congress to declare war. Maybe that's why we have so many, you know, undeclared wars in the last 50 or 60 years. Roughly half of college students could not correctly state the length of the terms of the members of the Senate or the House of Representatives. I could go on and on, but the bottom line is this. We've never been dumber than we are today. So put the screens down and read a book. Because it's, it's ironic that since so much information is available, we still just don't have it. it it's, it's true irony. Turn to Psalm chapter 90. And here's another thing on this same, on this laziness um, of, of physical laziness and mental laziness of screen time. Turn to Psalm chapter 90. Screen time itself. Screen time itself is at an all-time high. There's never been a time in the history of the United States where people spend more time in front of a screen than there is right now, today. All-time high. Look at Psalm chapter 90 and verse number 10. The Bible says, The days of our years are threescore and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, that means seventy years in the first point. And then, he's like, if by reason, if we're blessed to live till we're eighty, Yet is there strength, strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even thy, according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. This is saying, use your time wisely. This screen time, spending 10 hours and 40 minutes, I mean, what in the world? It's hard for me to even imagine that. I mean, you have been unplugged for too long. But 10 hours and 40 minutes a day in front of some sort of screen, you're wasting your life. You are wasting time. You're wasting all your life away. I mean, look, I mean, I even, I, I remember thinking this at family events when I was growing up, when I was just a kid, when we'd go somewhere for Thanksgiving and we'd all sit around and watch a movie. And I just remember thinking to myself, is this really spending time together? When we're all sitting here just watching a movie, I was like, is this really spending time? You know, everybody puts family time as so, you know, much importance, but that's not really spending time together, right? I mean, you're sitting there wasting your life away. So look, you want to be more productive? We're going to talk about this in the, in the series on Sunday nights for the next several weeks. Here's, here's just a little tip. You want to be more productive? Stop wasting time. You want to know how people who just seem to be really effective and just get a lot of things done and can work two jobs and all this, and you're like wondering, how in the world can that person do that? Here's how they do it. They don't waste time. I, they just don't waste time. Look, I'm not a big fan of wasting time. I don't like to sit around and do nothing that has no value at all. It's something I don't enjoy. And if you do waste a lot of time, you are going to be not productive. And, you know, if, if that goes too far in one direction, poverty will come, the Bible says. All right, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's get to the, to the point, or the, the verse on the front of your bulletin as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and look at verse number 11. I'm going to show you another all-time high in the United States today that's directly related to what we're talking about this morning. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Here's another all-time high. There's a pandemic in this country going on of arrested development. Arrested development from Pew Research. Let me show you. The Bible says, or Pew Research says, the share of young adults, 18 to 29, is where we're looking here, living with their parents is higher than in any previous measurement. So the amount of kids, 18 uh, kids, the Bible says after 20 you're a man, by the way. The Bible says that after 20, you're a man. So the amount of individuals from 18 to 29 has ne living at home with their parents has never been higher than it is right now, today. Turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, look at verse number 16. So I'll, I'll 
connect that for you in a few minutes, but just follow me here for a minute. It starts at an early age. It starts at an early age. Matthew 21, look at verse 16. And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have ye never read? Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. Look, these kids should be praising God. These kids should be praying and, and speaking spiritual things. The Bible says that that's what kids should be thinking about and consuming, is spiritual things. Instead, they're being raised on these weird visual cartoons with all these different catchy songs and all these different things. And, and by the way, it's subtly offering them shallow entertainment and worldly lifestyles at a very, very early age. TV will teach children to despise their Christian life by glorifying the opposite. And it starts out, folks, very subtly. Very subtly. It, I mean, look, the biggest lie of TV, and we covered this last year as well, but it's worth mentioning again, is that it glorifies sin. It presents a glorified view of sin. I mean, imagine a movie that glorifies prostitution. Imagine a movie that makes it seem glorious to be a prostitute. You know, that that, that would lead to a life and a path of luxury, a path to luxury and riches. Imagine a, a movie that glorifies fornication, murder, suicide, alcoholism. My wife and I were just talking the other night about a movie that we had both, and I'm not going to name these movies and all that kind of stuff, but look, my wife and I were just talking about you know, a movie that we had both seen in the 80s. And this movie is about these drunks that meet in a bar. And one of them is, is, is underage. The girl is underage. And, I mean, there's fornication. There's adultery. There's, I mean, one of the, the friend of the guy ends up committing suicide. I mean, it sounds terrible. It sounds terrible. Now, I mean, I mean you, does that sound like a great life? Christian? But then, now, but let's do this. Let's pitch it in the Bahamas. We'll make the scene in the Bahamas. We'll make both characters really good looking. We'll put music in there that, that dictates your mood. By the way, music can make anything feel like it's good, by the way. That should scare you. Amen. Music can take something that's just evil and wicked and make it seem like it's right. Music. Right. Music. That's the power of music. And they turn this terrible story into this happily ever after love story. And it was a very popular, very popular movie at the time. I, I just, you know, we just couldn't believe it. But that is the power of Hollywood and movies and TV to manipulate. To manipulate especially young people. Look. This, I talked about this on Wednesday night, but this, you know, if you tell people, you raise your kids, you're not going to watch movies, you're not going to do this, you're going to get some pushback from people in the world. We've gotten pushback like this. What, your kids, you're not going to let your kids watch Star Wars? No! No way on God's green earth are my kids going to watch these movies. Oh, but they're not going to understand pop culture. They're not going to understand when people at the workplace are talking about Star Wars. They're not going to understand. Good! I like it. I like that. Because guess what? You know what people don't come up to me at work and talk to me about? Pop culture. People don't come up. And it's, it, 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 amen. It's great. People don't come up to me and talk about football. Hey, I wasted my whole weekend watching stupid football games. They don't come tell me that. Because they can see the I think you're a moron in my face. They don't come up and ask me about pop culture references. It's, a, it's great. And they, they might have thought that, hey, that guy's kind of boring, but that's good too. Because I, I don't want to talk about those things. It's a blessing to have your kids not know these things. It's a blessing. Because guess what? You can't unlearn things. You can't unsee. I mean, this movie popped into my head from 1984. You don't forget these things. But here's the problem. 
as we glorify all these different sins and all these lifestyles as they're glorified to your kids, here's the problem. If kids actually live their lives like this, if they actually do this, they will end up in poverty, they will end up in disease, they will end up maybe dead. If, they fought, if they're like, hey, but at best, you know what they'll end up? At best, if they just, you know what, they'll, they'll end up lazy. They'll end up lazy. Let's go back to arrested development, the all-time high. Let's go back to psychology today. Remember that study of the electronics fast? You know what the biggest thing at the end of that study was? One of the biggest benefits of the electronics fast was a rapid increase in self-directed behavior. You know what that is? That's, it's, called, it's called being a self-starter. Screen time kills self-motivation. I mean, the secular world knows it. They admit it. Look, kid, parents, you know that teaching your kids to be a self-starter, you know that that will not come on its own. You know that that will not come automatically. You have to teach that. This is one of the things that I use repetition. My kids are, there's probably several phrases, this is one of them, that I say that my kids are probably like, ah, oh, ah, oh, heard that a million times. You know, but I just said it the other day, like two days ago. I'm like, look, you need to, you need to see something that, need, get, that needs to be done and do it without being told. That's the difference between a child and a man. A child walks by something, is like, oh, no one told me to do that. A man looks by, that needs to be picked up. That needs to be fixed, and they do it. I mean, I remember, Garrett, I still remember this moment on the farm with Garrett. I was, we would feed animals, and I, I, had, a, I had a bobcat. I don't know if you know what that is, a skidster. And I would drive it around, and it had a loader. And I had to put these two big 30-gallon pails on the bucket. And then I would, you know, fill them up, and then I would have to get out of the bobcat and, you know, pull them off again. Every single time we did it the same same thing every day. And I remember I was out there by myself doing chores. Garrett wasn't outside for whatever reason. He was in the house doing something. And he would normally, you know, he would see me. I never told him. I'd always get out and do it myself. I never told him to come out and take these off. It was something I just kind of did myself. But I pulled up to the, to the corral. And here he comes running out of the house knowing that I would have to get out of the, the machine and take the bucks off. And he pulled them out. He's like 10. And I'm like, yes! Not because I didn't have to get up, but because I saw that he, he's finally figuring it out. He's finally seeing, you know, a process, something that needs to happen, and he's just like, he's making that decision himself. You know what? That needs to be done. I'm going to do that now. I mean, that's the transition from a child to a man, is, is being a self-starter. Look, these kids that just never leave the home, you know, this TV, I mean, look, TV screen time, it breaks down diligence. It works against diligence. It's, look, folks, it's not normal. I've never seen it more than I've seen it in California. It's normal here. It's not normal. It's not normal to just have a child just live at home till he's 29. That's not normal. It's laziness. And in many times these cases, I think I've got a breakthrough for you, by the way. I think we've got a breakthrough for you. Many times in these cases, another all-time high right here, the age of the average video gamer has never been higher in the U.S. Now let me read these age ranges for you. The vast majority of video gamer, game players in the U.S. are now 18 to 38 years of age. It's never been higher. It almost directly matches the kids who will just never leave home and never grow up. Look, and it makes sense since we're seeing that, you know, these screen times makes you lazy, unmotivated, and unable to be a self-starter. It makes perfect sense. Look, folks, this video game stuff, first of all, it's just a sin. It's just a sin. Spending hours in front of a screen playing these games, which the games themselves are inherently sinful. And don't tell me that they're not. And destroying your future, literally, look, literally changing your brain. It literally, I mean, there's so many studies out there that says that screen time versus reading and learning from books, it literally makes your brain different. I mean, it's like drinking for 50 years. That's going to change your brain. 
It, it changes your brain. It changes who you are. Destroying your body. But the video games themselves, they're, it's a sin. I mean, it's all, I mean, I, I don't even know what they look like now. But 10 years ago, it was completely inappropriate. It was ultra violent. I'm sure it's gotten worse. As graphics get better and better and better, I'm thinking it's all worse. And guess what? It will lead to larger sins, especially if you somehow convince someone to marry you. It will lead to larger sins in your life. George Washington. You ever heard about George Washington's rules of civility? I brought that up. There's all these rules. I think there's 140 rules that he lived his life by. These rules of civility. Rule number 109 of George Washington's rules of civility is this. Let your recreations be manful and not sinful. Boy, that's a great one right there. That's a great one right there. Let your recreations be manful and not sinful. You know, ride a bike. Hike a trail. Do something that improves your body and mind, not destroys it. Thomas Jefferson said this about um, games played with the ball. This is a favorite one of the NRA. They always like to have this on their website. Games played with the ball and others of that nature are too violent for the body and stamp no character on the mind. Let your gun, therefore, be the constant companion of your walks. Teach your kids to shoot a gun. Amen. Go out shooting. Teach them how to... Look, every little boy should know how to shoot. Amen. I mean, it takes skill. You have to work your mind. You have to do math if you really want to get into it. I mean, look, it's a very valuable skill that will exercise your mind. So look, it's, it's laziness of the mind. It's laziness of the body. And it's, it's literally changing who are these generations of children in the United States are. It's changing them. It's changing them. Turn to Psalm 101. Let me give you another. By the way, you know, don't just replace your TV. Don't throw your TV away and then spend all your time in front of YouTube. I mean, what's the difference? I mean, it's still, that's why I'm, it's, it's called screen time, the sermon, not necessarily just TV. Okay? Here's another all-time high. Psalm 101. Look at verse number 3. The Bible says this. And I don't even like bringing this up. I don't like looking into this. I don't like even knowing about this. But it's too big of a problem to not mention. Psalm 101, verse number 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of those that turn aside. It shall not cleave unto me. Here's another thing that's at all-time highs. Pornography in the United States. 76, and this, look, it was just a year ago that I brought this up, and these numbers are worse now. 76% of age, kids age 18 to 24, view pornography on a regular basis. It's a huge problem. It's a huge problem amongst Christians, too. Because if you go and you look at the stats between Christians, there's, there's really no difference. That's pitiful. But here's what's worse. Here's what's worse. Here's the stats that really will scare you. It's being accepted today. It is no longer something that is shameful today. Only 43% of teens believe that pornography is bad for society. Only 43%. That is a minority. Teens and young adults, 13 to 24, believe that not recycling is worse than pornography. Thank you, public school. This is wicked as hell, and these are the next generations that are going to be ruling over us, by the way. I could go on and on, but I really don't want to. Look, if you have a problem with this, you need to disconnect from whatever it is that you are connected to. I don't know how many Christian men I have met that just don't have connectivity on their phone, and that is admirable. Because you know what? They recognized the problem and they fixed it. You need to, and here's another thing. Here's another thing. Teenagers, you look up here. How many, because I know, I know that it is an ideal situation to have a mother and a father in the home. And I know that for a lot of teenagers, that is not the case. So let me tell you something. You know, 
How many devices, I wonder, in this room right now are not monitored by somebody? How many smartphones in the hands of anybody in this room are there that are not monitored by some sort of monitoring software? Parents, if you want to fix this, you better get some software and you better have every single device that is in your home or in the hands of your children monitored at all times. And then, look, that's not just the one answer either. And then you have to pay attention. So you kids, you teenagers, you 18, 19, 20-year-olds, who's watching over you? Who's watching over you? Because this is obviously a huge problem. Look, in the 1950s, you, you say, what's the big deal? In the 1950s, you know they said that about smoking. In the 1950s, they're like, oh, smoking's cool. This is no problem. Smoking's terrible for your health. Everybody knows that now. But let me show you something. I mean, once again, the secular world is even figuring this out. How harmful this is. And, and I know, I, you know, I could go off on this for, for an hour. But here, secular studies. Pornography will change your brain. Did you know that? It will change your brain. Believe it or not, studies show that those who make more frequent use of pornography have brains that are less connected, less active, and even smaller in some areas. It literally changes the way that you think of things. It changes the way you function. And I'm not going to, look, I had to just like cross most of this out. And I was telling my wife this morning, it's hard to even talk about this and be appropriate. But it needs to be talked about. A pornography habit, this is a second secular study. A pornography habit can dramatically escalate into unexpected territory. A survey of 1,500 young adult men, 56% said that their tastes in pornography had become ex increasingly extreme. I'm not going to get into this one, but it just, it's just, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Pornography can damage your health. Secular studies know this. And I'm just going to, I'm going to give you the, the very, very light version of this. And I hope that the adults in the room know what I'm talking about. And the young adults in the room know what I'm talking about. Doctors are seeing an epidemic of young men who, because of their habits, cannot respond, respond to a real life person. Please. And, and by the way, it's not a harmless industry, by the way. Do you, do, you ever think about, do you ever think about the idea that, you know, this industry is directly tied to, you know, human trafficking and all these other wicked things? Do you think about the fact that this is somebody's daughter? Do you think about the fact, Christian man, that this is a human being? That has parents that love them? And obviously something has gone horribly wrong in their life. And you're going to take advantage of that. That's pitiful. Ladies, before you marry, listen, single ladies, before you marry, you better find out and you better ask some questions. You say it's uncomfortable, you ask questions. Because you don't want to marry somebody that's got a problem like this. 76%. That's three quarters. That means if you find somebody who doesn't have a problem here, it's like a unicorn. Who in the world are our daughters going to marry? It, it is what I think about. You better believe I'm going to be asking some questions. You're like, oh, I can't believe you're going to ask. Those. I'm going to ask. You, you don't even know the questions I'm going to ask. And you find somebody, ladies, that does have uh, some kind of issue here, you just, you just run like the wind. You just run. You just run the other way. Turn to Job chapter 31. Men, young men, married men, you will ruin people's lives. You just need to learn to control yourself. It's really that simple. You have to learn to control yourself. So much is riding on it, men. Since you are in charge, look, I don't care. Your family falls apart. Your family falls apart, man. I don't care what's wrong with your wife. It's your fault because you're in charge. 
I don't care what happens to your marriage, what happens to your children, all this, oh, it's because my wife was evil and this and whatever. I don't know how many times I've heard this. You know what? At the end of the day, all those things might be, must be true, may be true, but you know what? You're in charge. You're in charge. You're responsible. At the end of the day, after all the blame has been, it all attaches to you. Because you're in charge. And you have the ability to make it or break it. And that's what we're talking about here is breaking it. Look at Job 31 and verse number 1. I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Notice he says, I, made, I didn't make a covenant with, you know, he's saying, I'm not going to think upon a maid because I don't even look at what I shouldn't look at. He's saying, you know what? If I don't look at what I'm not supposed to look at, he's like, then I, it's easier to control my mind. It's that simple. You can't unsee things. You know that? I mean, I've given you sermons on the unlimited storage of the human mind. I mean, they pretty much think at this point that the human mind has pretty much can just, can just is, is infinite as far as they know. Because God's way ahead of science. God's way ahead of engineering. Look, you can store infinite amount of video and images and whatever. So Job's like, look, I made a covenant with mine eyes. He's like, I'm just going to control what comes in here. And then that way, I'll be able to control what I think about. You can't unsee things. There should not, there should not be an unmonitored device in this room, in this church, in your home. I don't care how old you are. That should be, that should be a true statement. Because this is dangerous. You need to be able to control yourself. And this is, by the way, parents, this is another thing that you need to teach your kids from a very young age. You use, I mean, there is so many teachable moments in being able to control yourself. You know, hey, don't say stupid things. Hey, you know, when you get to be a certain age, you just got to quit acting so goofy and, and all this kind of stuff. Why? Because it isn't inherently bad? No, but because you become this person that needs to learn how to control yourself. I have this feeling that I just want to act a certain way, but I have to control that. This needs to be taught to your kids at an early age. Repeat yourself. Repeat yourself again and again and again. Turn to Hosea chapter 10. Here's the conclusion this morning. Here's the conclusion. Turn to Hosea chapter 10. All this screen time and all this media that you're taking in in this passive fas fashion. If I, you know, if I can't convince you on anything that I've said so far, let, let me try this. Look at Hosea chapter 10 and look at verse number 12. The Bible says this in Hosea 10, 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Look, wh what are you sowing to yourself? What are you feeding yourself? The media, look folks, the media is changing us. I don't mean the media. I mean media is changing us. That's why even though, you know, you, we, we talk about this all the time. You know, California. California is so bad. They've gotten so liberal with all the, you know, the homosexuality that's accepted here and all these things that are accepted here. But look, you know, we're leading the charge. But do you notice the whole country is changing in the same way? It's because we're all consuming the same media. Right. That's why. That's why as California goes, so will the rest of the country. We're just, we're just the tip of the spear of all this wickedness. It's all the same. It's, that's the reason for all these all-time highs. It's all the same. Look, parents, this is not a small thing. You've got to get these screens away from your kids. Keep them away from the screens. Keep them away from YouTube. Don't get me started on YouTube. I, I can't, look, I think everyone's YouTube days are numbered anyway. That, that's my opinion. And maybe that's not such a bad thing. There is plenty of garbage on YouTube. I think one of the biggest, you know, uh, one of the biggest threats of YouTube to the Christian is that everyone thinks, oh, it's just YouTube. It's just YouTube. It's just YouTube. But with their suggestions and all their behind-the-scenes marketing and all these types of things. Look, YouTube is wicked. YouTube is wicked. It's run by a wicked company. 
Everyone thinks it's harmless, which makes it even more dangerous. Unplug. Unplug your family. Spend, I mean, these things will derail a productive life. These things will define your life. And these things can ruin your life. You know, so, you know, parents just think twice. Please think twice. You know, it's, it's changing. The, I don't care how harmless you think it is. These screens and all, it's changing the minds of your children. Literally. It's changing them physically and mentally. It's changing their health. It's changing their morality. It's fighting what you're trying to do. And ultimately, look, it's going to change their future. It's going to change their future. So you've got to unplug from it. I mean, don't be part of the trend. Don't be part of the all-time highs. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for um, the Bible. I thank you for all this timeless, uh, this timeless wisdom from the Bible. That even though, you know, eventually as things get bad, it seems like, you know, secular studies and science catch up to the Bible at some times. The, the wisdom of the Bible is all we need because it's so correct and so in-depth and it's always right. Lord, we just thank you for today. I pray that uh, you help everyone, you know, that, that has issues um, with these types of things we talked about. Lord, just get it right and, and just get things right. Lord, we love you. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. To hymn number 30. Hymn number 30, nothing but the blood. Sing it on that first verse. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part in this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of on the last verse this is all my hope and peace nothing but the blood of jesus this is all my righteousness Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Chrissy, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this, um, this sermon, Lord. Uh, please help us out to apply this to our lives. I pray for the soul winning and fellowship to come. In Jesus' name I say this. Amen.